First, so let me start by introducing uh, Mr. Daniel Alarcón. That's it. Yeah. Fantastic. So Daniel Alarcón covers Latin America for the New Yorker and is a co-founder and executive producer, Radio Ambulette Studios, uh, an award-winning Spanish language podcast production company. His most recent books of stories, The King is Always Above the People, was long listed for the National Book Award. Uh, Mr. Alarcón teaches at Columbia at the Columbia Journalism School in 2021, he was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship. So welcome, Mr. Daniel Alarcón. Janine De Noves, did I say that correctly? De Novaish. De Novaish, I'm so sorry. Janine De Novaish mm -hmm. is a writer, sociologist, and a teacher. Her first book, Brave Community, Teaching for Post-Racist Imagination to be published by Teachers College Press in April 2023, shares a method to create empathetic and resilient conditions for learning about racism in order to intervene on it. Janine has taught at Harvard University and the University of Delaware. Before that, she served as the Associate Director of Columbia University's Center for the Core Curriculum. Welcome, Janine, please. So to cut to the chase, you guys can just jump right into it and let's get the discussion started, you guys. Thank you. I went, if we get boring or slow down, you can jump in, help us out. Hi. How are you? How are you? I'm great. I'm okay. great. Thank you for setting this up and thank you everybody for coming out. Like I was saying, I know that there's lots of things to be doing on a Wednesday, so it's cool to see yeah. so many faces. Yeah. So let's see, uh, I've known Daniel since we were undergrads. I welcomed him to campus, like a mature, older <laughs> classman, and he was just one year behind me. And so that's something that happens when you're undergrads, like you think by the time you're a sophomore year. And then we got to work right away, protesting and getting into good trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, and since then, we've gotten degrees. He's written a lot of books. I've only written the one that you see over there, and you should get pre order. And we've taught, and we've had kids, and we've raised kids, mm -hmm. and we are excited to talk to you about all of that. Yeah, cool. You've written one and a half books. What's the half? The memoir. Oh. Yes, <laughs> one and a half books. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask you the first question. Sure. And then you do whatever you want after that. Great. When was the first time you taught? Mm -hmm. And what happened? The first time you ever taught anyone? Anyone anything? Like, not like... Not like... A your little friend, how to play, like... No, yeah, like no. A teacher, a teaching well, I, thing. I think um, teaching is an interesting um, way of approaching the world because ostensibly you're the one imparting knowledge, but in my experience, teaching has been a really enriching uh, uh, personal set of, of, of growth and milestone, you know? So uh, I remember very clearly the first time I taught, I was right out of college um, and I got a job at, um, you know, we have these settlement houses all over New York. So I got a job at Union Settlement in East Harlem at 98th and 3rd Avenue. And I was in their college readiness program, which was basically uh, checking up on the schools in the neighborhood and the kids who lived in George Washington houses in East Harlem. And I had to sort of like see about truancy, like why were the kids not going to school? Okay. And oftentimes I would I would uh, ask them, why aren't you going to school? And they're like, have you been to my school? <laughs> um, and so I started touring all the schools in the neighborhood and I got placed in a school called the Academy of Environmental Science, uh, which was right on the river 98th around there. And uh, I had a little, it wasn't even a desk. It was like a, it was like a stool with like a slightly bigger stool. And I was supposed to sit there and kids were supposed to come and talk to me about college, ask me about college. I had, there was no, I had no qualifications. There was no reason for me to be there. Um, uh, and I remember there was a, a college counselor who was very bright and sunny. She was from Queens. And she always said, she said things like okie, okie dokie. And uh, <laughs> she, she, was, she was just very, very sunny. Um, and I remember, uh, someone from City College was going to give a talk. She's walking down the hall with me. She's like, oh, I'm going to go nosh, go have lunch. Well, that was her terminology. And, uh, she's like, hey, someone canceled. They were going to come talk to the kids about college. Would you like to talk about college? Oh. 
And I was like, yeah, sure, uh, when? And we stopped in front of the classroom where she's like, opens where she's like, now, and pushed me in. Uh, so I am 46, almost. Um, when I was 22, I looked like I was about, you remember this? I looked like I was about 11. He did. Uh, so look, most of my students is were 11, 10th, 11th graders in uh, at the kind of environmental science in East Harlem. All the kids looked older than me. Uh, not all of them, obviously, but like, yes. I definitely looked super young. I'd never taught in front of a classroom, I'd never been in any situations outside of a classroom where I was a student, maybe give a little class presentation right, or something. Right. Uh, and then talk about the college admissions process to these groups of students. I only ever interacted with one-on-one -on -one situations where they ask me like, why do you, what are you doing here? Who are you kind of thing? On your little stool. On oh, my little stool okay, at the yeah. corner, like looking out the window at the river. Uh, and so they, they like, you know, now, boom. And uh, there was a teacher there and he's like, okay, our, our speaker has arrived. So, you know, checks out, like, you know, and it's just like me and I'm like, okay. Uh, and they're like, you? And I'm like, yeah, me, I guess. I went to college. Yeah. And so then I just started sort of like, you know, and, and it, it's just a story. You're like, okay, well, where do we begin? Like, how do you get to college? And I just, I just bleh, rift. But I had to do three periods consecutively of that, of that same thing. And by the third one, there, I was, it was pretty good. The story got tighter. Yeah. I mean, it was like, you know, it was, it was obviously terrible, but it, like they had, a certain consistency and a certain narrative arc and like these are the steps you have to take and like you know i had sort of uh, understood that you can't talk too much you have to ask questions right you know, right for questions you have to make a couple jokes you know and i always thought i was shy and then i realized teaching that i wasn't shy i just i just had to be a teacher first and then once you're once you're put in that situation you realize you're not you're you know you, you either shut down and run away or you realize that you're not shy and that you can talk to people you know and it was it was it was a cool experience because i mentioned earlier the question the kids would ask me when i asked them why aren't you going to school they would say well have you been to my school i realized yeah that that the schools i was i was at gompers in the south bronx i was at uh um park east um Academy of Environmental Science and another school around there. And, uh, you know, there's, there were some great teachers, fantastic teachers. And there's some, some places where the institutional support structure for those teachers was so poor um, and so mismanaged and just had so many holes that even the superhero teachers couldn't make right. it work. And, um, but what I decided to do, I was like, I don't want to be a counselor sort of trying to convince kids to go to school. I would rather be a teacher in a classroom trying to convince students to come because I, I met students who would skip school, you know, every day, but they would always go to one class. Right. You meet there's always like, the one teacher. There's always, there's, and I was like, if nothing else, I want to be that teacher. Right. And that's what I did. So the next year I went back, um, I organized the summer program uh, in creative writing for all my students. I hired Felice Bell. And oh, wow, Felice yeah. Had, I hired Felice uh, to teach poetry. Uh, and so we had a class in creative writing, which I taught, a class in poetry and a class in playwright, which another friend of mine taught. And I got all the kids in my cohort uh, internships. I don't know, I just still don't know how I did this, but I called everybody. That's amazing. I just called like theaters. I was like, hey, do you have a spot? We'll, we, we got some money, we had some grant money. It's like, we'll pay the kids. You just need to give them something to do. And I had kids like sweeping the floors in some theater in the Lower East Side. I had kids like handing out flyers in Times Square, like anything that was like remotely culture oriented that had to do with writing and the most generous and elastic definition of, of being uh, having to do with writing. And, uh, and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm, I should just do that. And I became a teacher at, in a public school here in the city uh a school that no longer exists um in the building where Thurgood Marshall Academy is or was on uh, what Edgecombe. grade were you teaching I was teaching 10th grade English okay. and I remember I got up it was a very long-winded answer but no, it, no, it, it's really like changed my life like I said like I discovered that I wasn't shy which was a huge sort of revelation um what are you going to teach uh you have 100 students so like, what books do you have? 
a hundred copies of. That's how you. Wow. That was yeah. that was it, and we didn't have a hundred copies of anything, literally nothing. But what books do you have the most copies of? Well, we had like sixty seven copies of the bluest eye of of the Tony Morris. Right, right. And I was like, okay, well, that's pretty good. So like, let's buy thirty three more, and then we can teach and then we can teach that. The books didn't arrive till like late October. So like, what like first year teacher, you know, just like okay, I have to fill an hour every day and do it four times. And uh, and it was and I realized like my first period class was terrible because I was just rushing. I was always behind. But then by the fourth, the fourth period class was great. Right. Because like I've already iterated it, honed it. Same. I had I had all the beats down and it worked. Yeah. How about you? I started late. Um, I was listening to you and I was thinking about that. So I, I feel like I just finished having a sense of imposter teaching syndrome about teaching because I had an experience where I thought that I was a learner. I still think in my heart, the parts I'm a learner. And it wasn't until I learned about critical pedagogy in the sense that those are the same, they're two sides of the same kind of craft. I was sort of amazed by my teachers. I thought that it was a kind of a magic trick what they did. And my mom is a master teacher. Eileen is a mentor from early on and that's a masterful teacher. And I just didn't think that I could ever do that. I just thought, I'm really good at learning and sometimes I can translate my learning to other people. I can bring people along. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know until graduate school that that's actually pedagogy, right? Like the, the actual root word is to take somebody along. That's exactly what the thing means. And so for me, it was graduate school that forced me to have the experience of stepping out of that shadow of saying, I'm not the teacher, I'm just the person that at the seminar table will like hold forth and like hog up all the airtime. Like that's actually a teacher. Um, but I didn't think that I had it in me. And I, I developed the, the methods that I wrote the book about from that position. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna watch student experience in courses about racism and I'm gonna, talk about that and even that late in my trajectory that research was very um in the beginning kind of blind to the pedagogical aspect I came at it as a student like how are the students experiencing this class yeah and it, it still had that until I got into the field work to watch how it happens I was still being like what is the magical special sauce that's happening and now in retrospect it's obvious to me that that's the the pedagogue and that's the teacher in the room it's not only I want to ask you about that because you mentioned in the intro that you that you regret that you only spoke to the professor once that's in right. your course of semester can you talk about what you might have asked them sure or like what what is it that you regret not being able to follow up yeah so what he's talking about is that the the book is is based off of a study that I did of two of two college classrooms of courses on race and I spent one semester embedded in one and one semester embedded in the other. Um, and at the time as a like baby researcher, I mean, I wasn't a baby, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I wasn't aware of how much I should have talked to them. And I spoke to the students three times over the course of that semester. And I spoke to the professors only one time in depth and one more time after. Yeah. In retrospect, when I went off went out into the world to do the work myself <laughs> is when I wished that I could go back and ask them things like um, how they thought about being authentically in the classroom. What were the challenges that they were experiencing as like our cultural, the surrounding environment around the subject matter was changing? Like, what is it like to teach this in 20, you know, when I was, in the classroom with them is 2014, 15. So in terms of the racial First, situation, yeah. that's different than 2018, which is Charlottesville. But it would be different than when they started in like 2000, or, you know. And different from when they were exactly entering the field. Yeah. So by the so when I the first time I taught was 
I had done the research. I had written a dissertation. I knew exactly what those two people did. Um, and I had even started to teach people how to do that. Yeah. And then I had to go do it. And the two professors that I followed closely were two men. And one was a white man and one was a black man, but they were both like really confident and really experienced, uh, charismatic. And I said, oh, snap. How, like, how am I going to do that? I'm not those things. I mean, I've never taught before. And they, they were walking into classrooms of undergraduates that were already like wowed by them. They were great, but it was kind of already set up that way. And I was like, man, I'm walking in and everybody's like, mm. and you know, I was like a my, graduate like student. student. And me and like, and like, yeah, and I was a graduate student at, the, at, at my graduate school. So it's like in your later years, you get to teach. So these are people who outside of that room were peers yeah. and now I'm teaching. So I just, I had to basically read my own work. And I was like, okay, what this is. Um, and it said, you know, among other things, you have to be authentic. You have to frame what you're doing with an attention to both the content that you're about to teach and the culture that you want people to adopt around this content. And you can only do that if you're an authentic person. So then I had this really cool journey, like literally the day before where I'm sitting there being like, what is my identity as a teacher? What's that like? And the way I came to it is for is thinking about what was exciting about learning. Yeah. And like, you know, when I was in Belgium and I was the, the only kid that looks like this, literally picture this, but shorter, uh, same hair actually. Um, in a, in a Belgian classroom, so I had just gone from Cape Verde to Belgium. Everybody spoke French but me. Like Madame Colette mm. used to like really deliberately call on me all the time. It wasn't hard because I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but she would like make sure to like repeat my comments and she would like ask me to come up to the board and say it again. Yeah. She would do all these things to make like my conspicuousness a kind of belonging. And then, you know, when I immigrated to the States, I, I left like a tiny island country and I ended up in Brockton, Massachusetts, where the high school is like almost a thousand kids. I mean, it's four buildings the size of a big high school. It's that one high school. I got there and I was like, I need a visa to just be here. <laughs> There's probably like, you know, and again, like Dr. Zach, my 10th grade teacher was like, no, this is cool. I'm so excited you're in honors, you know, uh, Western sale. And why don't you do this role play? And why don't you talk to us about what you think about it? The role play was, you know, um, when the black hand attacks Ferdinand and launches the war, I got to be the wife. Um, um, and so it was all these moments of like, learning is about making you feel seen and giving you a sense that you belong, that you have authorship about material. And so with that, I walked into you know, my first yeah. class and I, I told them why I was teaching about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing to think how, like the, 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 the kind of reverence in your voice when you talk about Ms. Colette uh, and the, the, to take that on to say like, okay, now I get, to try to be that person to someone else, to another young person. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. It's both like a huge, it's a huge ask of oneself and also a great opportunity to pay it forward, you know? I think so. I mean, I think that's the, we call this conversation besides like a chit chat, yeah. a chat with, um, education as the practice of freedom. I think what's really exciting for me about that formulation is that it takes that responsibility seriously. Yeah. Um, that it takes that responsibility seriously as core to a relationship amongst people. Yeah. And so for me, it was, it is that I find it edifying for myself. It's a practice of my freedom mm -hmm. to be in that relationship with someone. Yeah. And so I think in that way, I was able to get away from this feeling intimidated to feeling called to it. 
Like if I'm in the room with other people and we're learning, that's the highest expression of being people. Hmm. Like that's that's what human beings, that's literally why we're like different than the other apes. Hmm. <laughs> no disrespect to the other apes, but it's the whole thing about like, we don't just learn to like make the fire. We learn to make the fire and we teach Jeez. somebody to make the fire and you know, and therefore I pump. Like that's, you know what I mean? And I pump. We don't know what comes after that, probably bad, but um, like it's something about that for me. Yeah. And that's why I still feel like it, to go all the way back. It's like, am I a teacher? I don't know. I feel like a person, you know? Um, Jalen, Jalen, well, we made it X minutes, whatever, without me saying Jalen. And mm -hmm. five. Jalen is my son, and I don't really go 20 minutes without talking about him ever. Um, but Jalen one time was asked, um, he's one of these kids that if you said, Hey, why didn't you go to college? And he'd be like, Have you seen my school? Mm -hmm. He's that kid. My kid is that kid. And one time he was asked by a group of graduate students, future researchers and educators what is the one thing that he wishes teachers, future teachers or educators understood? So this is like junior or senior Jalen um, had done me a favor of speaking to this group. And he paused, he thought about it and he said, just be people. Hmm. And that whole room just, like they thought he was gonna say like, you know, I don't know, yeah. first the equity and inclusion and change the career. And that's all true. But he was like, just be people. I think that's so interesting. When I, my, so my first like job as a classroom teacher after <laughs> sitting in the corner in that school uh, yes. was was at um, the school called Bread and Roses Integrated Arts High School, which I mentioned that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the director of the school was a woman named Carol, uh, lifelong teacher uh you know the the families in the neighborhood loved her she had she stepped up and started her own school and it was very bread and roses as you might imagine it was a very lefty school very progressive small school uh all the teachers went by their first names um and uh and that was like that that just i think was interesting for that to put in my first mm -hmm. experience in the classroom it was it had all the uh, you know, sometimes the New York City public school system does not take to experimentation. It also does not, um, it does not favor the, the, you know, basically like hippies who become administrators because it's like a battle, right. internal bureaucratic battle for resources that if you're a flower child are not going to survive, even if you have all these great intentions. Um, so, so we had a lot of limitations. I don't think I got paid till like Thanksgiving. Um, but, uh, but she did, she, she was, you know, she might not have been so great about like scheduling and like administrating, administrating but she, and she, I don't even think enjoyed that uh, at all. But she just, you know, she just loved the kids and the kids loved her. And she was, you know, and for a long time, you know, the school lasted 15 years. I right. think for for the first half of its life, when she had the energy to do that, like she got by and the school survived by having like, you know, VPs who were, you know, assistant principals who were who were better administrators than she was and her charisma alone. And it was instructive to be around that and to 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 know that uh, you know, above all, you could never you could doubt a lot of things about her, but not that she she cared. Right. I mean, and that's not everything like um, uh, I'm going to do a tangent, but it's not a tangent. But, you know, Bell Hook's idea of engaged pedagogy is a, is about the fact that you have to have on top of the the sense of the critical aspect of the pedagogy that you have to attend to people's well-being. Yeah. It's not it's not incidental to the task. It's actually core to the task. But what she also says is that for that reason, you have to be self-actualized as a person. Like, and you know, this this gets us to what I wanted to ask you about, which is like teaching in conditions where people aren't free, where people are constrained. Yeah. Because what, what Bell Hooks was writing about was that for you as a teacher 
to be able to facilitate the well being of your students, of your learners, as core to the task, connected to the, the content, not separate, the same. It's as important. You yourself have to be well. You yourself have to be self actualized. Mm. So, um, so, like, put, put your mask on before you put exactly on your, in the and have access to this thing that you're yeah. supposed to help another person access so i wanted to ask you about teaching in situations in prisons where people are not free and your experiences there like when did yeah. you did that start at lurigancho in peru or? yeah but you know i just i, I could I think i want to talk about that too but i also want to there was an experience that i had which was not as a teacher of a classroom. Right, right, right. But it was as a visiting where I was in 2006, I was asked to join this group of American writers lecturing at uh, universities in the Middle East. Okay. And I was like, yeah, let's go. It's like, that sounds fun and interesting and different. And what were you guys lecturing about? Our work, which is of no relevance whatsoever to anybody. <laughs> We couldn't get our books. They weren't translated to Arabic. But y'all are Americans. Yeah, that's, but it was like, relevant. you know, and I remember we got a briefing and the briefing and the, the most relevant information was like, you do not represent the government of the United States. Oh, so you were not American. Yeah, but so we go and I remember our first uh, talk was at the University of uh, Damascus. Okay. Um, and it was, you know, I read a little story and the other one read a poem and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was fine. And then uh, one one of the people there was like, "Okay, so let's take some questions." And uh, and they put the mic in the class, and then it was just like, just like being hit with fire hose of uh, of a torrent of you know, like no one. The students were never going to have an American they could yell at, and they had us, <laughs> and and it was amazing. It was like. You know, and I was, you know, we just had to take it. And it was an incredible experience. And then, and it was like so. So you did represent the government. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, the, the, you know, very quickly, like you couldn't defend yourself or defend the country or defend foreign policy or like what, you know, why did Bush attack Iraq? And I was like, you're an idiot. Like, I don't know. You know, uh, and there was, and I realized. That was also a, an interesting teaching moment, right? Where, like, your question—it's not that people weren't free; they were free. They were young people, you know, in a country that we didn't know was going to be on, you know, on the cusp of war. We did the same talk in Aleppo, same result, same. You know, it was like as as soon as the they had the opportunity right. to confront us, they did, and it was like a beautiful thing. It was right. a really, really humbling. Um, and an eye-opening situation that I that I adored is a similar, slightly different thing happened at the in Ramallah in in, in, in Palestine. A uh, very different situation in Tel Aviv and in Istanbul and other places that we went. But it was it was incredible. It was incredible, and it was it was also like sometimes your role is that too to listen to listen, even if the if the there was a certain uh, you know. A a anger that sometimes sort of like eclipsed the coherence of, of what they were trying to say. Sometimes you couldn't understand the details, but you understood the message. Right. Uh, and it was also uh, edifying, I think, as an American who both is and isn't American to sort of like to, you know, people are always saying in this kind of uh, vaguely, um, you know, catchphrasey way, like check your privilege. Like there is no, like I, my privilege was checked for me in in you know by 350 Syrian university students who weren't going to take this like oh but I was born in Peru thing <laughs> seriously you know and and I thought that was that was just a, a, a like such an amazing and unforgettable experience. What's the lesson? What's the what's the I have, kind of have thoughts, but what's the pedagogical lesson in that moment? <sighs> I don't I you know I don't I don't I don't know I don't know Janine I don't know I think mm -hmm. the 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 lesson I think a few things I think one I think that uh I learned so much from being put in that situation oh yeah okay uh, so I think one of the things is like you know whether or not that was useful to the students I don't know 
but I do know that it was useful to me as a human being. Sure. And I think every teaching, and this was what I was trying to get at the beginning, every teaching experience I've had, I've always sort of like, whether the students learned something or not, like you go through that process with other human beings and at the end of it, you, you are a different person. And so that's one of the reasons why I love teaching because you do go through that <clears throat> on that intellectual journey with them and and you definitely get something out of it. You learn also by having to codify the things that you know and make put them into little uh, digestible pieces right. for, for people who want to learn them because sometimes you don't know what you know until you have to organize it into a lecture or organize it into a semester, you know? In this case, I think the, 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 the lesson also is, is not so much about pedagogy and just more about your one's place in the world right. as someone with a blue passport and as someone who, um, you know, wherever I go, no matter, you know, people are, you want to be people, just be people. Like Jalen says, it's true, but being authentic also means recognizing the limits, the limits of that and also everything that you're carrying with you that is the good and the bad and the privilege and the trauma and everything. That's also part of who I am. And if it's useful to these 350 students to yell at me, they weren't yelling at me personally, but right. they, but, and they weren't yelling, they were incredible. They were, you know. Right, you know, right, right, right. But they could, they, they weren't, they, they couldn't and they weren't attempting to hide their anger, nor did they have any reason to. And I think we all quickly understood that, that we were serving a role there and it was an important one and we just had to take it. Right. It was not what you went to do, but it was what needed to happen. You know, oh, your pretty story. Then yeah, I'm like, fuck that. That is not what this was about, you know? No. And they don't, they didn't care about my stories, nor should they. There was no, there was no, it was like I said, irrelevant. The other situation was in, in this place called Burigancho, which was the, which is the the largest prison in Peru. Um, when I went, it, it was it had been built for like two thousand and five hundred inmates, and there was more than ten thousand inmates living there. So it was incredibly overcrowded, and um, and I went to visit to to present a book there. I was invited to to. to that was the first time you went. To... Yeah, I'd written a book, and there and I met a guy who was always trying to get writers to go, um, and he he was having a hard time getting writers to go. And I said, uh, I said, well, I'll go. So, so I went and um, the class is over. They were a class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, and so I, I went um, and it was, uh, I remember they gave me a tour of the, the complex first. And I was talking to the guy and, uh, you know, just making small talk. And you're like, okay, so where do you, where do you live in this giant right. place? And he said, I live in block 18, but I'd really like to live in block seven. And to my untrained eye, all the, every part of the prison looked the same. And I was like, well, what's different about block seven? And he said, oh, they have democracy there. And I was like, <clears throat> so, so I just started. They, they have, have democracy. democracy. And so what I understood, it took me like several trips. I was just so intrigued by this. Like, what do you mean they have democracy? What does that mean? So what I understood, it took me several months to figure this out. Um, is that the, the prison was designed or had become basically uh, an imaginary map of criminal life in Lima so that every section of the prison was controlled or rep was, you know, was from a different district of the city. Hmm. And all the district, uh, the power structure of, the, of crime in those districts was reflected in the power structure of the blocks. So there was no democracy. It was like whoever's boss in the streets, their representative is boss here because we're in this district. Right. Basically, this, this this place is an imaginary extension of Surquillo or La Victoria or wherever. So that's all fine and good for petty crime and you know murders and robberies and extortions and stuff. For drug trafficking, the people who were in prison were from Nigeria from Colombia, from Mexico, from Israel, from Turkey, from the United States. There was a guy from Redding, California, from Germany, from Chile, Spain, 40 nations. Those guys don't care at all what's happening in the streets of Lima mm. because they're, they're only in Lima to do business. 
they happen to be caught and they might be staying seven years, but they don't care what's happening. And then, so that's one part of it. That's the, the distribution and the production part. We're all guys from the jungle because that's where they grow the coca. And so those two groups had no interest at all in who's running the streets in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. They don't care. And so they had, instead of, they had, then they had this kind of, they had this opportunity to create their very own power structure that didn't reflect, you know, petty criminalities outside of the prison. They could just do whatever they wanted. And they created a dem democratic system that has lasted now like 25 years. Every year they vote and they have campaigns and they, you know, and, uh, and so this, this was, you know, I was like, okay, well, I want to know all about this. And so what I did was I set up a creative writing class for this that's how you huge as one does. terrible lack of imagination on my part like, what, <laughs> what can I do and so uh in order to get permission to go in every week I set up a, a creative writing class and just started going people and, should just ask you whenever you set up a creative writing class like what are you actually trying to do <laughs> really honestly um and it was it was a little remarkable I spent where were you where was it is it in that block that it was, was in that block it was in block seven um and you know I mean, I, you know, I would give them little things to read. I would read what they were writing, give them prompts. Sometimes I would have 10 people show up. Sometimes I'd have three. Sometimes people would come once and they were coming back. Some people came every week. Um, it was, it was fascinating to, to sort of hear the stories. And then once I was in, I was just stayed and I'd stay all day and lots of people would move around the prison and, um, and, uh, and Block 7 really was like a gated community within the prison. You know, there was a story of one guy who'd gone out of Block 7 uh, to talk to somebody and he'd been kidnapped and taken to another block. And he'd been kidnapped within the prison and had to pay a ransom just to go back to his to Block 7. Huh. So it really was this its own universe separate and outside of Lima, you know. And I ended up spending, you know, five or six years going constantly, consistently gathering the stories and then eventually writing about it. Hmm. So given all these places, all these places you've taught and now you teach you, hmm. what, what is like, what does it mean to say that education is the practice of freedom for you? Or do you not even believe that? I should put that on the table, I guess. I think, I mean, it's, a, it's, we, we could spend a long time just talking about what it's like to teach across the street here in journalism at a at you know at this moment for journalism yeah that's that's that like it it feels very fraught for me personally uh because i see my students they're very talented they're very committed uh they know more at their age than i knew at my at, when i was their age um you know, but the, the headwinds that our industry is facing are intense. Also, I'm in a in a professional school, yeah. so I don't teach the topics. I teach skills. So it's like, how do you record this audio? How what kind of how would you approach this scene? What kind of tape do you need to get? How do you then go through your tape and organize a story? How do you how do you you know let's think about story structure like. You know, but then I also teach the very basics of reporting, like how you do an interview, you know, right, right, right. like, you know, what is a beat, you know, like, how do you find stories and sources, like, so it's, it's, you know, I have all these other things that I'm interested in that are like Latin America and, and criminal justice and immigration and all these kinds of big topics that are, that I spent a lot of my other life dealing with, but in my class, I'm just like, it's a skills class, it's a production class. Um, and sometimes that does feel very liberating mm -hmm. because I'm giving you the skills that then you can take and do any kind of story you want, right? Um, and then sometimes it feels limiting because I feel like I want to talk about these other things right. that I'm passionate about. I was going to ask, yeah, especially in the in the new headwinds, are you feeling like a sense of urgency about that? That you know, knowledge producers, journalists generally, but knowledge producers are are needing more. <laughs> more of the topics than just the skills. Yeah, I mean, I think, no, I, 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 I mean, it, go, it comes and goes, but you know, we spent the day yesterday in my class um, just listening 
to, you know, they, they were they were super tired. They have tons of deadlines. Their mass, their thesis is due next week. So I was like, okay, we're gonna do an edit today. We just we just did. Why don't we spend the, the the three hours Tuesday night? I'm gonna bring in like six things that I think are really interesting to listen to, and we're just gonna break them down. Um, and then afterwards, I was walking out with my co-teachers, and I was like, you know, I could do a whole semester just listening to stuff. And break in. Yeah, just listening and breaking down. How did this get done? What do we What do we know? What What can we? How can we reverse engineer this story? What would we have done differently? What about the writing? I have scripts for 25 minute stories that are annotated. Like you see how they do this and that. And I love that stuff. I love that stuff. And it does become in the same way that pedagogy teaching about teaching becomes its own topic. Um, that then you can apply those rules everywhere or those lessons everywhere. I feel like um, breaking down a story, how do you make the story becomes its own topic that then, you know, that then they can apply to any other group and any other subject matter. I mean, do you ever feel distant? Like you, you, you don't, you're not teaching classes of like the classes that you were studying. Right now? I mean, I did. That's what I did for a living. Yeah. 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 But, but your, but your book and your. Yeah. My book is, is about, about how you create like an approach to that. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. not content. My book is not content. Yeah. yeah. What was the question? If I feel distance about. Like, what do you prefer? Ah. Um, I prefer to teach content. Yeah. Um, I prefer to teach content because I teach about race and culture and inequality. I feel that the line between content and how the content is treated and delivered is like non-existent for me. Mm -hmm. um, I so I, I bless you. I prefer to teach content. However, I feel like since since our country went racially mm. and hasn't really, it's just downhill. Um, there's been my sense of urgency has been about the approach because I don't think that we have a content problem at all. Yeah, it would be ridiculous. Like we should not concede that we need new information about this problem. <laughs> um, despite what the people are saying on the right, we don't. But the how we approach this um, education, this kind of education is critically important. Mm -hmm. And I think that the ways in which we've not been as rigorous and as sharp about how we teach about racism in this country has helped the wrong side of the fight. Can I ask you a question? Like, do you, do you feel there's any place or necessity, or do you feel any? You, you say in the introduction that you kind of aren't writing to the people who don't have buy-in, right? <laughs> you're not you're not interested in the people who don't think this is important. And I wonder if there's, at the same time, sure. At the same, at the same time, the the research shows that teaching a, about racial justice benefits white kids tremendously as well I mean uh, you know that it has it do you ever feel like you or is there a necessity is there a place for selling the concept and justification for this kind of teaching to white people better like like do you ever feel specifically like yeah no I think there's a, a a need for us to do it better for everyone no no no, no of course like the need is there, but like, inter like the, how do we convince? Yeah, I see what the question is. The The point that I was making in the in the introduction is more about if you don't have an investment in this democracy, mm -hmm. do not buy my book. Right. We don't have a point of like, you know, we can't begin a conversation. Right. Not like if you don't think that learning about racism is important. I think everybody should think that. So I have a pitch for everybody about that. Okay, okay. okay. But when I, when I speak of the we, and I yeah. say, and you know, I, I think I say something like, we're all kind of failing at this and we're all getting recruited in perpetuity into a racial nightmare because we're not doing this right. That's a big we. And so I had to say, because people ask me all the time, are you talking about ramp, you know, rabid racists? And I'm like, no, mm. I don't think so. I would be surprised if they joined, but that's kind of like not my thing. Like, yeah, yeah. 
But so I have to say that explicitly, I thought, you know, I had to do that five years ago. Now I really have to say that, like, because they walk well, among us. Yeah, no, but I also feel like, you know, they're they're banning books in, in Florida and they're, right. they're, they're dismantling uh, sort of long established and not particularly radical sort of curriculums about basic facts of American right. history all across the country. And that's absolutely harmful and destructive to white people. Yeah, and I feel like the, that someone needs to tell them that. I'm, I wrote a whole book, Daniel. <laughs> no, yeah, it's true. No, yeah. I think I think that's what the point is. Yeah. But what I don't want to do is here's here's the imagination. Here's here's the post racist imagination. Those of us who want to solve this problem come in all uh, uh, come from all backgrounds. Yeah. For a pedagogical approach to have a kind of, and that, I know you're not saying that, but I just feel like I'll, I'll just expound. Like for a pedagogical approach to have a racial de predetermination that says like, this is a book for white people to learn about mm -hmm. racism versus not. Or if you have white people, this is how you do it versus this is brave community is both impractical for obvious reasons, you're laughing. It wouldn't, you know, we'd never be done, but, but more than impractical, it is ethically, inappropriate. Hmm. It's ethically bankrupt. Why? Because pedagogy means fundamentally that someone is going to go from point A to an unknown point B. And critical pedagogy means that if I hold you in my mind to a predetermined trajectory mm -hmm. based on your identity, then I have betrayed, I have, you know, failed my own duty as a teacher. And so you cannot argue for something, and I know this is gonna be hard, it's gonna be like an uphill battle in America these days. I can't stand and say, this is a method only for sometimes, only for these kinds of people, only for these conditions. If I have to do that, then I don't write the book. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. I could just be quiet, you know, and having my little niche, you know, my little niche activity and just say, you know, I'm just, but if I but if I am a member of this democracy and I am in it and I believe in it, we we all got to get in it together. Yeah. And what goes for me has to go for you, has to go for her, has to go for, for her. And pedagogy, I think, has to be that. It has to have a, a baseline common denominator that works for everybody. Yeah. You know, the the another way to think about this, just to wrap that up, is like, you know, when you think about universal design for learning which you know, disability activists have taught us so much about, right? The idea is this is not only about including people with disabilities. This is about creating a world that is just generally more inclusive. And so you, know, you put the ramp in front of the building. You don't wait for somebody to be like, hey, excuse me, can I have a ramp? Yeah. It's, just, it's a better building if it has a ramp. Right. And so that's that's what the book is about. You know, this is this is better pedagogy for teaching this intractable, difficult, gnarly subject matter. And it's good for anybody. You know, if you give me that too many bucks, 30 bucks, that's teacher's college fault, by the way. <laughs> um, it's not I'm not getting any money. But if you give me that, I have to be able to look you in the eye and say, go take this wherever you're going and use it. And absolutely, it will be helpful. I don't need to like look at your passport or your, you know what I mean? Yeah, or see who's in your class. Or see who's in your classroom. No, no, no. It's that, it's a it's a modest proposition. Yeah. Uh, but ambitious though, but modest in its in its yeah. claims, but you know. Yeah, modest. Everyone apply it to your classroom is not modest. And it yeah. works. You yeah. know? Can I ask you guys a question? Yeah. Of course. So is is there a difference for you guys between education and pedagogy? And also, how do you define education and how do you define freedom? Uh, you say that uh, education is a vehicle for freedom in, in a sense. How do you define what education is and what freedom is? What does that mean? Nina Simone says, <laughs> Nina Simone says something pretty close. She said that freedom is not being afraid. Hmm. I think she said that. She just had a birthday and everybody was tweeting Nina Simone clips. I believe this is what I'm pulling that from. But um, so that's, I like that. 
Yeah. It's not it. having fear. Hmm. I like that because, and we could all talk, we're going to talk together, right? Um, I, I like that because fear is a contextual thing. It's a subjective thing. And fear is also to do with agency. Like, I don't get to tell you, you shouldn't be afraid of this if you tell me you're scared. Mm -hmm. And if you tell me you're scared, that should be enough. And we live in a society where obviously that's not the case. Um, that's one reason. The other reason I like that is because as a, as a parent, I've been thinking a lot about this and this is will take us off topic. So don't follow me there. <laughs> Let me just make this point. As a parent, I've been struggling to write an essay about how my parenting experience sets me apart from white parents because of that, my relationship to a fundamental metaphysical, like existential fear uh -huh. that I have for my child. That if you parented without that fear, then we're almost, we almost have different, entirely different experiences, but we don't. I think a lot of you said that, I will not, I, I, I will not follow yet. you there, but I, I will say that one of my students once said about, about my child, that this child has never felt, um, uh, has never been tortured and yeah of course my, my child has never been tortured and and she said and he's never been traumatized and he has not been traumatized so I, I, so as i said i'm not following you down that way but that but but i know i know i know what i know what you're saying but i want to ask something i want to follow up on what ivan was just asking and um i want i, I want to ask you um i want to ask us to think Go a little before Nina Simone and think about uh, Machiavelli and think about freedom from and freedom to. And I also want to ask about the difference between freedom from, freedom to, and emancipation. So is education an emancipatory project? Is it a freedom from project? Is it a freedom to project or are, are these interconnected? Do we, do we teach our children to, to, to think on freedom, but we teach our students to think on emancipation? I'm not thinking that, I don't believe that. I'm, I'm just asking if, if there are different locations uh, from which we can enter the question of freedom and emancipation or that we can move away from them, right? I feel like this is a conversation above my paper. Um, You're a genius with a glance. <laughs> I'm so down here, you know? Like freedom I, is actually down here. Yeah, I was thinking about this because because I don't I don't <laughs> I don't I don't ever approach my planning. Maybe I should, but I when I plan a semester, first of all, I, I'm an over planner. I learned that first day when I was shoved into a classroom in East Harlem that that what you think you're going to talk about, you better have like an extra forty five minutes of stuff uh, because you might bring them something that you think is super cool and then. 10 minutes later, they're bored with it. So we got to do something else. So I learned that a long time ago. So I'm an over planner. And I also think a lot, I've been thinking a lot about, especially my spring class, which is you know, a little bit more space to, to, to spread out. I think a lot about um, the, you know, if I'm, if I'm not necessarily preparing students to go out and get very well paying jobs, uh, what I can do that justifies my existence in front, in front of the classroom to them is give them what I think are um, important human tools that journalism provides. Mm -hmm. um, and principally, I think, I think the most important thing that, that I teach or want them to learn is humility. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a journalist, you're a professional listener. 
and you're hearing people, it's a radical way of, right. of listening to hear people the way they are, not the way you wish they were. To look at the world the way it is, not the way you wish it was. And uh, that means sitting across the table from people who are who you agree with, people you have quibbles with, people you, you know, vehemently disagree with, people you find repellent um, and listening because this is the world we live in. That's, that's the people that are there. Um, and often, you know, if you do your job well, people are going to tell you about the worst day of their life. Right. And, um, and people ask, you know, my students will ask me like, how did you get, how do you get such and such person to tell you those, those things? And how do you, you know, and uh, a microphone is a powerful thing. You don't shove it in people's faces and ask them about their worst day. You know, right. you, and I think what you were talking about, go back to the wisdom of young Jalen, but it's like, just be people. And it's like, that's a lesson for my students as journalists that I try to, to give them. And whether or not they go on and many of them do go on and do amazing things in our field, uh, telling amazing stories and reporting on really important beats. Um, but I hope, my hope is that if they don't, the year they spent with me learning about journalism does inform other aspects of their life yeah. and inform the way they behave as citizens, behave as, as, as partners, behave as you know, people in a community. Because I think listening is like a really undervalued um, skill and practice. For sure. It's an empathy practice. Yeah. Um, so I think that is actually like quite classically and what, a, what an education is supposed to do. I mean, I think that is, um, I'll come to the Machiavelli, but that is, you know, that's Dewey and Soulcraft and the idea that a democracy has statecraft, right? That we have to learn, but he said, and we have not listened, that we also needed soul craft. So the, the inside, the interior life of people needed to be shaped so that they could be in a democracy in these ways that you're talking about, actually. Because what we're, what we're talking about is that it's not, it's not enough to be in community just by being bodies there that there's a way that you're supposed to be able to turn to someone again. And what you're talking about is like here, receive their difference with empathy, make room. And the, what, the reason you do that, which you made it very like about the craft, but really the reason you do that is because you want them to do that for you. Mm, yeah. That, for, you know, for each other. yeah, like a, a, a degree higher, it goes into like, what is the task? Okay, journalism versus what is the task? You know, teaching this fourth grader uh, their fractions. But fundamentally, what we're really talking about is that is that human exchange that we were talking in the beginning about <laughs> to, be, to be people requires people allowing you. Yeah, requires someone to excavate into the world, the place where you get to be yourself. This is not something you do yeah. alone. Yeah. Um, and so I think like to your question, for me, it's never uh, just freedom from. I think it's that's too very necessary, very necessary condition, but it is always freedom too. So for me, education is really training for the imagination and and the pedagogy is the is the craft of facilitating that. That's the difference. But education is training for the imagination. Oh, yeah. And I don't think anybody imagines oppression and walls caving in mm -hmm. and life sentences and scarcity, scarcity. Like no one imagines that. You know, you imagine goodness and joy and being satisfied and abundance. You know, and if and you've been if you've been broken by the world, maybe the way you imagine that is a little is broken too. But fundamentally, that's what I like about it. You know, I I feel like when I'm teaching people to teach and they're like pushing back, I'm like, I'm giving you the cheat code. Like literally, this is the only way to be okay in the world. Everything else is just gonna be terrible, you know, like it's a gateway to narcissism, everything else. But to be in a learning relationship. 
with someone is is sound. It's always sound. We're we're not like built to want to aspire bad things. We're just not. So if you're after facilitating people's aspirations, you're you're good, man. It's gonna be okay. What's for you? Quite, uh, I, 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 so I guess my question is about journalism and the ethics of journalism. And how do you approach journalism as a practice with norms of a, a, a preconceived set of uh, ideas of what is ethical or ethically practiced in terms of asking questions and listening uh, in context where the imagination is messed up and and where it is problematic and uh uh to be in a, 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 a to take a picture to take a photo and then to uh actually uh uh ethically uh uh take account of what is uh you know, presented because it can be kind of frag it can be kind of fragmented i think uh to approach education and journalism with without a uh without kind of some kind of through uh, so I, like, I totally respect the, the cheat code, uh, concept, uh, but then when does that cheat code, can, can that cheat code actually, uh, kind of blur when it gets, when it gets out of, because I, I don't think my imagination by, by any means is perfect. And, and, and so it's like, how do you go about, uh, like, like from my perspective, like, a, a atonement, right. Uh, uh, how does that, how do you approach that from a journalistic perspective uh sorry yeah, that's a lot yeah <laughs> I, 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 I just do think it comes back to humility and honesty and i think you don't ever and you know and, and janine mentioned uh the concept of authenticity and i think you are your best self and you're your most authentic self that means being honest about who you are to yourself and also to the people that you're interacting with. And I think, you know, I talk to you the same way I talk to my sources. You know, I don't pretend to be anything that I'm not. I'm very upfront about what my goals are. I'm pretty nice to people, you know? I mean, like, I just don't, I, I think you talk to people and, you know, you treat them, I treat, I try to treat everybody the same. It gets messy. Right? It, it always that, gets messy. That, that's what I'm that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm guessing. It's the, the blue line of the messiness of what. Okay, so I, I did a piece many, many years ago about uh this thing in California uh called a, a gang enhancements. You guys know about this? Mm -hmm. So uh, just briefly, gang enhancements is like uh if you uh are with your friend. We have New York too. What's that? We have a we, we have in New York too. Okay, so I was living in California at the time and there's this whole thing about it where just, just for the, many of you probably know, I'm gonna explain it for those of you who don't. If you're with a friend and uh, there's three of you in a car and one of them, one of you has a gun, he goes oh, in, okay. say he robs a liquor store or something. You didn't even know that he was gonna do that, uh, but you're all wearing the same color sneakers. They arrest you all and they accuse you all of being in a gang and they add, a gang enhancement to the punishment to the potential sentences. And it's like this really remarkable tool for prosecutors to get uh, people to plead guilty because you know you're not going to risk going to trial and um and having you know seven extra years added to your sentence. Um and and of course it's used you know overwhelmingly 98% on, on on people of color and um and if you do go to trial, they have a trial within a trial. So it's like, we're going to try to think you're guilty of this crime, or we're also going to try and try you and see if you were a part of a gang. And what they then that gives prosecutors the opportunity to show, take your phone and show pictures of all of your scary black friends to a white jury. And then, you know, Thank what's going to happen, you know? So it's a, it's a crazy tool. Anyway, so I, in order to report on that piece, I talked to people in the criminal justice system on all sides. I talked to prosecutors, I talked to, to uh, defense attorneys, to um, 
to young men who'd been put on gang lists, to activists, to neighbor people who were scared of gangs, to people who'd been on juries, to teachers. Uh, and I talked to one guy named uh, Froilan Mar Mar Marcial, who was uh, in Stockton, Stanislaw County, a uh, gang investigator. And he took me, got in his SUV, and he drove me around. He's like, this is where the gangs are in Stockton. And we went around, and we drove around Stockton, and he's told me his own story of growing up in the same, in this area, and gangs, and gangs, and gangs, and gangs. Um, and then I went, we dropped, you know, we went back downtown, I got up, and then I had an, another interview, and I went back to the same area and got the tour of the neighborhood from a kid who'd been put on a gang list. Um, and I, I, I didn't, I hadn't even planned it that way, but when I ended up being in the exact same neighborhood, exact same streets, except now I wasn't in this giant black SUV, I was walking around the streets with a kid from the neighborhood, uh, and I was in his house with his friends, talking to his parents, you know. Um, and it was this like morning, afternoon, day, you know, a whole day in these, in these areas. And I'm getting to the point, which was, uh, I liked both, I liked everyone I met that day. I'm the kind of person I like people. I really like people. I like, I, I just am inclined to like people. Um, I don't, I mean, with, with obviously with some exceptions, but you know, I, I generally, like I have this problem where as a journalist where I, I want to believe everybody. So I'll sit across the table from a politician who I know is lying to me. <laughs> and, uh, but they're good at their job. And I'll just take notes and I'm like, man, that sounds great. And then I'll listen back to it and I'll be like, okay, he was lying there, there, and there. Um, I don't think Fordham was lying to me ever. He was a stand-up guy, but he's coming at the world from this, you know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and we had, I published an article in which basically I just, just, you know, based on my research, based on everything that I, everyone I talked to, I came to the conclusion, the article conclusion, that this is guilt by association, it's undemocratic and it's insane. I can never say that, but that's, if you read the article, I'm hoping that that's what you will get from this because that's what I take from it. Froilan wrote me and he was like, you were wrong about this. And I was like, you know, yes, but this. And he was like, but that kid you talked to is a gang member. And I was like, well, says you, you know? And we had this really interesting exchange. Um, I told him before the piece came out, I called him up because I like people. I was like, hey, I really appreciate your time. I thought it was really instructive and I learned a lot spending those two hours with you. Um, I want you to know this is what I quoted you saying. Um, I also spoke to these people and they say things are very different, but I just want to know I respected that. So then we had this exchange and uh, and it ended with him saying, you know what, I don't think we're ever gonna agree, but thank you. You know, um, and it was it was a good exchange. It was like, I don't think that in order for us to, to believe that the other person is a human being, we have to agree hundred percent, you know? But there is that sort of like empathy, humility, I think in the role of a journalist that it's like, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to listen, but I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to the person who's arguing the other side to you. And I'm going to try to figure out what the truth is, you know? And I, I just don't know any other way to act. Um, I really don't. I don't, I, I, I don't think it's that, I, it's not that I think, it's not that it's easy. I just don't think it's, it's not an unusual situation because the world is messy. So I'm not scared of the messiness because that's just how it is. Yes. Uh, Slip you, um, you try to come to an understanding with the person you're having a conversation with, no matter what beliefs they may have or intentions that they may have. We're going to agree. More like me coming to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, this came up a lot and it comes up a lot in the J school, um, you know, because it's like, I've sat across the table from killers. Oh. I mean, I've sat across the table from, I've, I've gone out looking for terrorists to interview. Oh, okay. uh, I've gone to places that are very, you know, I've, got, I've talked to people who've done horrible things. It's like, why wouldn't I be able to then sit across the table from a Trump voter? It's like, are you crazy? It's like, like, of course I can. You know, it's like, I've, it's not, or, or like a QAnon wacko. Like, 
I don't, I think, I think that stuff is insane. However, it's a, it's like, you can't turn your away from it. It's there. It exists. And it's like, I, I, I need to, to talk to, I mean, I don't need to, cause that might be, you know, but if I were a political reporter, I want to, I want to understand. And also as a human being, I'm genuinely curious, like how it is that people come to believe things that I think are Heinous. heinous is one way of saying it, but like I also wonder is like I'm a citizen of this country I'm a part of this democracy how can I have a dialogue with someone who thinks that like space aliens are living inside the White House like running child sex trafficking rings it's like it just beggars belief it's like it's it's so uh, I mean like as a as a concerned member of this republic like I, I want to know how that happened right and so to do that yeah. You have to talk to them. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Now, like, I talked to a guy one time who had been a member of Fanny Path, and he had put a bomb in a movie theater. And um, 20 years passed. He'd been on the run. He'd been in jail. He had, uh, everyone had tried to kill him. Shining Path, police, vigilantes, everybody. He had been estranged from his daughter. He had gone out of prison. He tried to recreate that relationship. And then, you know, so he's not living with his partner, but he's trying to be a dad. He's out of prison. He's, so he's, you know, sees his daughter and she says, dad, dad, I want to go with my friends to the movies. Can you take me? Yeah, sure. And, uh, and she takes, she, she, she's like, oh yeah, we're going to the Pacifico and meet up with this. I was like, okay, cool. He drives there and he's like, that's the movie theater that I bombed where, you know, luckily people didn't die, but people could have died. You know, he put a bomb in a movie theater. And now 20 years later, he's taking his daughter to that movie theater. He dropped her off. She's like, puppy, are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. She went in and he just sobbed. He told me this story. Um, and it's like, it's all there. You know, the, the, the human experience is there. It's a novel in that anecdote. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, but but you have to you have to be there to listen to it. You have to be there to hear it and take it in and process it. Um, even if I, I've never written that story anywhere, but if nothing else, I think it was useful for him to tell it. You know, to me, to get out, get it off his chest. You know, he's not a person who walks around telling everyone he's crying or that he cried. Carries it all on his chest. Yeah. To approach these situations non-judgmentally makes the difference too. I think. Do you agree? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I do think that when you're in the role of journalist, you approach without judgment. I think when you're in the role of like voter, in the role of citizen, you know, member of the, the democratic conversation, you approach with judgment. You can, you can say, okay, this person is craven and bad, uh, and what they're proposing is racist and horrible. Um, but that's like a different hat, you know. I I I I I think that's a different different hat. But I think in my practice as a journalist, yeah, I approach without judgment, you know. Especially in, when you're in that phase of interviewing, you're in that phase of getting to know the subject, and you're like, what I like about journalism, I really really enjoy it, is being able to ask any dumb question, you know, and just be like, you know, like I, I can try to sound smart later, but right now I need you to tell it to me like I'm an idiot. And it's it's such a great. You learn so much. I mean, like you know, I, I I I've been so lucky. I've gone to places and been places and talked to people that I never I had no business being there. And I and I, I people have told me. I mean, it's I'm just so lucky. Just so lucky. I I do believe it's important to. Um, he doesn't want to leave. Sorry. You yeah, I do believe it's important to um talk to people when you're journaling, in, doing your job in a non-judgmental way, just for the reason like I don't think nobody would want to talk to nobody who's looking at them in a judgmental sense. You know, I wouldn't want to talk to nobody who's looking at me. I'm black, so I don't want to talk to nobody who's looking at me. Oh, he's just a black kid, you know. I'm more than that. So yeah, I, I understand what you say, what you say. Extend that courtesy back out into the world. Exactly. You know, it's like, and that's what I, that's what I was, that's exactly what I was saying. It was like, 
that if nothing else out of the year that the students spend with me or with my colleagues at the J school, if, if they take that approach to life with them, that might, that, that'll be useful, you know? It's a shame that so many journalists that you see on like talking heads are so full of themselves. And so, not that's yeah, I know, but that's what, when you, when you, when, when people say they hate journalists, I think that's what they mean. They hate pundits. They hate pundits. I do, I do often hate them as well. I mean, uh, in special opinologos, you know, like, you know, just opinionators, just they're, they're opinionologists, you know, but that's yeah. not journalism. Journalism is not like, it's not, journalism is not like, I know this and I'm going to tell you. It's like, you know this, tell me. And then I'll try to organize it into something that someone else can can process. What is that element to um or around propaganda or not no, not not if I mean if you if you hold a mic up and a bullhorn for a for a for a politician and don't ask them questions, then you are hmm. you are committing an act of propaganda. You are hmm. not pushing back, you are just letting them talk. A, 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 an interview is a conversation. An interview is like, okay, I'm going to let you talk, but I'm not going to let you say something that isn't true right. without pushing back and asking. And, and, you know, there's different approaches to journalism. I don't, depending on who you're interviewing or who you're talking to, you have a different set of tools. You know, I, 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 I am, I have a, a very different approach for talking to, to victims, talking to perpetrators, you know, um, and, and you know, talking to politicians, you know, you don't, you don't, ex you you aren't as, as generous because they know the game they're playing. They know who you are. They know the rules of this. They know what on the record means. You know, like you you don't you don't you explain someone who doesn't know. You explain what on the record means, you know, and you say you don't have to tell me anything if you don't want to. You can tell me to leave. You can tell me to turn the recorder off. Yeah, you know, I think that's really important. That's what I mean by. Like, but you have to assess the situation and say, and no, in order to ethically ask this question, I need them to understand what I want to do. And sometimes I might sort of like, it's okay, the first 15 minutes of the interview is like, I might be in someone's house and they, they had, they didn't, they, they let me in because they thought they had to. Mm -hmm. It's happened to me in Peru because in Peru, you know, I, I speak, I speak good Spanish and I look the way I look. And there's so much racism in Peru that people will just let me in. And then I'm, and then I'm like, ma'am, you don't have to let me. Let me explain to you what I'm doing, you know. But they're like, oh, he was, he's such a nice young man. He must be important. He's talking so proper. They let me in, and I'm like, but these people that sometimes have often been used and abused by the media in my country. So I have to tell them, I was like, look, okay, let me explain to you what I'm trying to do. You know, the recorder's not on. You don't have. This is not TV. Nothing. Let me just explain to you, and then, and then we have the conversation. It's like, do you still want to do an interview? And then, you know, they might say, let me think about it, come back tomorrow, call me tomorrow, young man, you know, whatever. And then that's fine, you know. Um, I did a story, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Uh, you're fine. You're fine. Th there was a, it's a terrible crime and there was a perpetrator, he was in jail. And, I, and, uh, and I, I wanted to talk to the mom. I wanted, to, you know, I went to the house and I was like, hey, I'm doing this thing. She's like, no. But then at the end of my trip, I talked to everybody around the neighborhood and around this crime. And I went back and I said, ma'am, just give me, give me five minutes and let me explain. Everyone that I've talked to says your son is a monster. Everyone's saying the same thing. And he did a terrible thing, but you know, other parts of him. But if you don't tell me, no one else is gonna know. And the only thing that I can say is what people have told me. And she, was, she said, okay, you can record me, but you can't use it, the tape. Hmm. And you can come in and I won't talk about anything. I'm going to only talk about his child. And so what did I learn? I went inside. She showed me his room. I saw the, 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 the poverty in which he'd been raised. I learned that she had an abusive boyfriend who beat him. And he'd had a, he'd had a learning disability ever since. I learned that he was a hardworking kid who got up at four in the morning and went with her to the market every day. Um, to, to sell things, to sell, they, she prepared breakfast for the workers at the bus terminal. And she went, he went with her every single day and helped her. So I learned all these things that, that created, I think, a more um, in-depth portrait of 
this perpetrator who did a terrible thing. Um, but people do terrible things every single day. People do terrible things. And we can't just discard them from society because they did terrible things. They're still part of society. You go to any prison in anywhere in the world and you will find people, human beings, and you will find it's, it's, it's just a, a, all this human potential locked up. And, um, and I don't excuse at all the things that, that this, this, this young man did, but I felt like it was important to understand the context. And I was important to talk to the mom and the mom was the only person who could do it. And I was persistent, respectful, I tried to be very, very upfront about what I, what I needed and why, and it worked. I'll come to you. Does anybody have this side? Please, so no, sure. oh, oh, oh. then we'll come to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you both. This has been awesome so far. Uh, it's like the first time I've ever come to anything like this. And uh, one of the things that just kind of caught me uh, was when you were talking about as a journalist, you know, it's not your job. You believe it's not at least not your first priority to pass judgment, but you had mentioned with your vote and as a citizen, it is. And I was wondering, and maybe I just, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I, I actually think that, yeah, the vote would be, you know, you make your judgment with your vote for sure. Uh, but when I'm trying to understand my fellow citizen, who I, I believe I have a to, right? Like I'm part of the community and uh, to meet them with the empathy, I think it's really important as well to try and understand where they're coming from. Um, so I don't know so much if it's my question, but I, I wanted maybe more clarity on that because that's something to me that I really try and practice. Uh, Cause you know, we started the conversation with like asking why, why we believe that, uh, or what, what's exciting about learning. And then you told the story about, I want to go to block seven, there's democracy there. And there's something so fundamental about that, which also means that I have to ex at least try and understand ideas that I don't agree with yeah. to then come to a reasonable conclusion among the citizens. So anyway, it was just looking maybe for clarity among that and just... Anyway, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't think that the. I, I. I think that listening is the point. You know, it's the practice. It's the point. It's. It's the building block. You know. Uh, I don't think that we're ever. I don't think that means that there's a there's a magical consensus that's somehow eluded us all in this democracy. For, you know, I. I, I don't think that. But I. I, I do want to try I, I think that listening is just the very first thing that we do to try i'm i'm a big small talker you know like <laughs> i chat i chit chat i know i talk to people you know and it's it can be a problem because i'm very busy so sometimes i'm like like what can i do to avoid having to talk to people but it's not because i don't want to it's just because i'm so busy so i'm like let me run down the hallway or let me throw my hood on or like wear big headphones there's nothing playing i just don't want to you know uh but uh but I, I like the the little interactions that remind you that you know i like when people don't know they only know you in little contexts i like people that don't know your last name they i like the people that i play with soccer with because they don't care what i do you know <laughs> i do want to say that i enjoy you no, go ahead. I do want to say something that is percolating, I think, in the room, or maybe I'm reading it wrong, which is that certainly for what I do, which is teach and learn about how we get out of the racist predicament, mm -hmm. there are ideas that are not sound, which is like a you know complicated thing to say. But I think I want to say two things. How we do that is in practice and is in community and is in the, in the way that Danielle is talking, how we get to those ideas and approach those ideas. But I, I feel like in a learning environment, there are ideas that don't belong because they are, let me finish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they are questioning the fundamental humanity of people to an extent that we don't have to do right now. Mm. Because 
we've done this already. Can you give us an example? That's a question. That's yes. A question. Is there a relationship between race and intelligence? No. There is not. We've been here already. The historical context, which is soaked in blood of actual people like us, bears this out that we have done this work, we have struggled through this work, we have answered this question. To perpetually ask and answer this question creates a condition where not all of us are equal learners and participants in this democracy. So the thing we're trying to do to be emancipated is impossible if we keep having to pretend to reinvent the wheel. If I have to answer a question, am I a human being? Or as a trans person, am I actually real? The New York Times is in trouble for feeling like it needs to ask that question literally every week. Are trans people people? What might be? Then to the point about the democracy, then we're nowhere. And so we have to, and again, we, we can't do that by discarding people. We cannot do that by banning books. We cannot do that by yelling at each other. We certainly cannot do that on Twitter or on Facebook. Please delete your accounts. <laughs> it's destroying our society. Uh, coming back. Okay. But, we have, but we have to do some of this work. We can only do it together because if we don't do it together, then somebody's like, you're just the woke police and you're trying to suppress me and I just really want to think my crazy racist thoughts and you are, you know, my first amendment right. I get, I get the complication. I want to be in that mess with everybody. I know that it's messy, but I do think that we all know when we are in the presence of those ideas. We all know, no one here is young enough that you don't know that there was a time when not too long ago, Nazis just weren't marching in the street. Did they exist? Yes. But were they in Charlottesville with tiki torches? They were not. And guess what, y'all? It was fun. It was better then. So to pretend like we can't do better in the face of certain things, when we have like the weight of history behind us and actual experience, no, no, that question was asked and it was answered. By, by people who are our ancestors. And I don't mean black people. I mean, all of our ancestors were put to the question. The racial question is about 500 years old. Is there a natural hierarchy of human beings such that these people are people and everybody else is not kind of people? And so that's no. Can I say one thing about this? Yeah. I completely agree with you. And I think that, that there's one I mean, the journalist has to talk. To no, people. you're right. I want to be clear about that. I yeah. want Daniel to do his job. No, no, no. But I'm I, just I, saying I don't have his job. Yeah, we are done. Finish. Cynics and bad faith actors. I don't have any patience. But, right. Because I do feel like there are plenty of people who have been who have been misinformed, who have been deliberately disinformed, who have been manipulated, yes. who have been uh, miseducated, who don't know history. And there are people who know and are lying. Mm. There are people who are know and are cynics. That, and and I, right. I approach every interview assuming that you're that we're operating in good faith. When I understand that you are not operating in good faith, then the rules change, right. and all of the courtesies that I might have extended you as a as, as a as a as a human being, are, the, the, those rules shift. Yeah. And I think that the 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 real danger in our society. Is are the cynics, the people who are lying, right. the people who know they're lying, the very instructive these text messages, the Fox News, you know, all that stuff about the big lie. I mean, I, that's like that is it. Yeah, it's people who like I know I know what's real, but it's more profitable to me to tell a lie, so I'm going to tell a lie, and that I have no patience for. But we can, but we have created a condition. Y'all need to give us a check on time. We have created sure. a condition where there are a lot more people that we have left sub to be subjected to that, to that okie doke. What did you say, Five minutes? Okay. Okay. I can do math. <laughs> what are y'all doing? Like, this is too many numbers. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Five. So yeah, so what I mean is that, that that is true. And then we, because we don't do this this work 
enough, to your point about the empathy work, um, we have left a whole bunch of people, I feel, and this this is the silver lining, I guess, uh, vulnerable to these bad faith actors. A whole bunch of people, you know, in this country a after Obama were put to the question, things are changing. Yes, no. And for the people for whom it was a no, I don't like the way this is going. I don't like this multiracial democracy electing a black man. And then we know what the story is. For those people, we did not have the presence of mind or the tools to say, you don't get to say you don't like that. Let me run, walk you through how you don't get to say you don't like that. We didn't do that. We coddled them. We said, oh yeah, you could say you don't like that. That's not racist. That's probably your, your economic anxiety. And you're not really okay with a racist president. That's probably his charismatic appeal, speaking to your heart. But both can we, be true. Yes, but we didn't do the other thing, which is like, hey, let me listen, let me tell you something. What you've been told about this country is not true. That which you are holding on is not true. You don't need to hold on to it. Let me explain to you why. Our vision is for everybody to show up together at the end of the line. No one's excluding you. We spent five years entertaining this narrative that said, no, these people are entitled to be in a panic. They are entitled to feel this way. And it's not racism, it's feelings. And, and you need to have empathy for these feelings. And we missed an opportunity because the folks just asked the question. The folks were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it not cool to be white anymore? What's going on? And the, the good people, us, were like, and the bad people said, no. That's, what, that's what's happening. They're coming for you. And those are the, those the most here. Yeah. So where has education and pedagogy, where has, educa where has education, our education and our pedagogy gone wrong, so wrong that it has made that possible? Have where have we failed, we as teachers? I think we have been comfortable. I think that we have been meek. I think that we have been cowardly. And I think that we have been habituated into believing because the right wing wanted us to believe that these would just be cultural wars. And that every five years, the same kind of right wing dudes will have an argument with the same kind of lefty dudes and they'd just be fine and it would just run it over and and we did not prepare for the fact that these people were not playing around and that they were actually going to ban books and fire people and that they would start at the you know critical race theory but they would end at don't teach anything to anybody about anything so i think the failure is in thinking that <laughs> i'm going to try to say this and maybe it works the failure is in thinking that the way to handle a multiracial democracy is to trick white people into being decent. That's what America does. It's like, you know what? Just give them a diversity, equity, and inclusion language. Use a euphemism. Do a bartering. You know, Derek Bell talks about interest conversion, that all the advances that people of color have made only happen if there was a benefit for white people. Hmm. So yes, affirmative action because it benefited white women and so on and so forth, right? What if we had done something else, which is I think what you do, I do, a lot of us do in class, is say, I treat all of you as equals, have the capacity to assess the situation if I tell you the truth about history and to say this is an unequal and I would not sign up for this society. I don't have to coddle you. I don't have to trick you. I don't have to be like, you know, just let's be people about it, you know? And I think that that has been the failure. I feel that there's been a way that society has coddled the majority, the racial majority, and I find that it devalues those people actually. It, it belittles those people because every white person does not need to be or is not even invested in racism. But we have let 
the powers that be create that narrative. And so we've created an education that when, and this last thing I'll say, when they started to encroach, we were like, oh, it's fine. Oh, it's just the critical race theorists over there. Oh, it's just ethnic studies over here. Oh, it's just voting rights. Oh, it's just, you know, and it's like, just just look at this. This has been this, the same persistent thing since like, you know, reconstruction, really. And from the very beginning, I said that was the last, this is the last. What happened after the Civil War? The people who lost were told you didn't really lose. It's the beginning of that BS. You didn't really lose. You were really about your heritage. It wasn't about slavery, et cetera, et cetera. It creates this habit. And I think we are at a point of possibility where a larger number of white people are able to say, I don't need this BS. I don't need it. I'm good with the truth. I'm happy to be told the truth. And I think, I think that's where the failure has been. Now I'll be quiet.